Amen. 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 All right. Here's where we'll be today. Luke, starting off in Luke, we'll finish in 1 Peter, those verses. If you're a note taker, that QR code will take you to my notes, and you can email that to yourself when you're done. You can take notes digitally on that and then email it to yourself when you're done. If you like to do that, you're welcome to do that. If you don't like QR codes, just type in fbcdan.com slash notes, and it will take you to the same place. So we are more than halfway through Advent now. Uh, it's a great time to reflect and to, and, to be, and to just focus on what matters the most. And uh, we try to do, we don't always do, but we try to do an Advent series uh, during Advent time to help us focus on things that matter the most. So Advent just means the uh, expectation or coming. So we're, we're focusing on Jesus' birth, but what that really means uh, for us ultimately, more than just Him coming here, it, it means more than that. So we're looking at the King of Hope, the King of Peace, Today, the King of Joy. We did those the past two weeks. Today, the King of Joy. Next week, Truett will be preaching on the King of Love. Christmas Eve at 6 p.m., the King with us. And Christmas Day at 10.30. Let that sink in. At 10.30 on Christmas Day with no Sunday school, the King of Kings. So that's where we have been, where we are today, and where we are going. So if you're there, great. We'll be reading those verses here in just a second. Um, So... King of joy today, right? The king of joy. You have to kind of speak to the obvious. Uh, some people don't, don't get this, and I hope, I hope you don't get this for a long time. I hope you never get it, actually. Chances are you'll probably get it at some point in your life. But many of us that have gone through certain things in our life understand this. The holiday season, it heightens everything. There's a hyper focus on everything during the holidays. So during, during this time, things that are good are really good, and things that are hard are even harder. Uh, so as we talk about the king of joy today, you have to speak to the obvious that, yes, this is a joyful time of year. Yes, the fact that God wrapped himself in flesh and came to earth as a baby in a manger, in a feeding trough, it's just, it's, it's amazing that God loves us enough to take the punishment for our sin and give us the gift of forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life. It's an amazing thing. It's a joyful thing. But circumstantially, the circumstances of life can be difficult during this time of year. And so hopefully we can speak into that a little bit today. That yes, circumstances can make us grieve. Circumstances can make us sad. Can, circumstances are, are hard. But underlying all of that, I think, is the fundamental truth that the king of joy gives us a joy that overrides circumstance. And that's what we're looking at today. So we're backing up a little bit. We've been looking at different things right around Jesus' birth. We're backing up just a little bit before it and then going back into it today in the scriptures that we're, that we're in. So Jesus had a cousin that was uh, a little bit older than him. He was born before him. Um, and he was talked about in the Old Testament also. His cousin was. Uh, it, they were telling forward of the coming Messiah, they also, the, the, the anointed one, the king of Israel, there was also foretold of a forerunner, someone that would come before the Messiah to pave the way for the Messiah, someone who came to prepare the way for the people of the coming of the Savior. And so we're backing up to that part of the story today. Here, this verse is not in our verses for today, but di, th- it was prophesied to this guy's parents also that he would come. So the angel said to him, do not be afraid. This is Zach- talking to Zechariah because your prayer has been heard. <laughs> Zechariah has been praying about something. Your wife Elizabeth will, will bear you a son and you will name him John. There will be joy. Notice how many times that jumps out today. And delight for you and many will rejoice at his birth. Talking about the birth of John, who we call John the Baptist. So Zechariah had the lot fall to him at this time. Okay? In other words, the dice rolled in his favor. There were a bunch of priests at the temple, and on the Day of Atonement on Yom Kippur, a priest got to light the incense. It was a huge honor. There were many priests, and you only had Yom Kippur the Day day of Atonement once a year, one day a year. So to light the incense was was a great honor. It was probably something that Zechariah would only get to do once in his lifetime. And the lot fell to him during this time, and he was able to light the incense, and as he's there, all the people of the, of the church, basically, all the, all the Jews in the, in the area are outside praying, and then, and then this happens. The incense is burning, and the whole assembly of people was praying outside the sanctuary, and then bam, an angel shows up to give Zechariah a message. He says, you and your wife Elizabeth 
which is a relative of Mary. That's how, her and, that's how Jesus and John are related. Probably an aunt, maybe a cousin. It doesn't say, and we don't know. Y'all are going to have a son, even though you're old. <laughs> that's what the angel says. You're old. You're past the time when you should have a kid. You've been wanting a kid. I heard you praying for a kid. You're going to get one. And he's the one that's been foretold of by the, by the prophets and the fathers. So even though you've tried many times through the years and you couldn't, God's about to bless you, and his birth is going to cause rejoicing. John's birth is going to cause rejoicing. So uh, this section we're heading into, Elizabeth is now pregnant. This has happened. What the angel said would happen is happening. She's in her sixth month of pregnancy. Uh, and actually, they probably... It, it doesn't say it directly, but it indicates that they've probably kept their pregnancy fairly quiet so far. Uh, Elizabeth has kind of kept to herself. Why is that? Maybe because they had had trouble. I don't know if you've ever had trouble getting pregnant and miscarriages and things like that. That's a difficult thing to go through. So you're kind of skittish sometimes about talking about it when you're pregnant. Maybe it's because of the uh, prophecy we don't know why. Maybe they were just like this prophecy was overwhelming and they just didn't want to share anything until it actually happened. So they've kept it quiet so far. But the angel Gabriel is showing back up again to tell someone else that something is happening. Okay. And so let's read through this large section. This is a larger section than we normally look at on a Sunday morning. We're going to read through this large section, discuss it, uh, and then move into one last main set of scripture for today. So we can see that Jesus is the king of joy. So this is Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth. Now that's the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy is what that's talking about. To a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, check it, rejoice, favored woman, the Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. Why was she deeply troubled? Well, I don't know. I'd be scared, too, if an angel showed up and started talking to me. That would be kind of overwhelming, I would think. I, I, that's never happened to me. I have had moments in my life where I, the Holy Spirit was so thick, it felt like, like God was sitting next to me talking to me. I have had those moments. But I've never visibly seen something appear and start speaking to me. I would be a little, what's going on? Now, also, if I were Elizabeth, you probably would have been too. Verse 30, then the angel told her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call his name Jesus. He will, he will be called great, and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end couple of things here is pretty cool. And we've talked about this before, and most of you know this. The name Jesus is Yeshua in the Hebrew, or Yehoshua, if you say it full. You know, they shorten names just like we do shorten names. That name literally means Yahweh saves, or Yahweh delivers. So it would have been, like we hear the name Jesus, and it's just like a name. But when you heard when she heard the angel say that, she would have known instantly what the angel was implying. To call this child the deliverer, the savior, could only mean one thing. And so it's, it's really neat that in the name of Jesus, what he came to do, it's right there from the very beginning. But I like how, and I've tried to highlight through this series, how often Jesus is referred to as a king. He will, he will give him the throne of of his father David because David was the king and that was part of the prophecy of what God was going to do through this person. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Only a king reigns. So we keep coming back to that. I hope that has jumped out to you some during this series. So continuing, Mary asked the angel, verse 34, how can this be since I've not been intimate with a man? Now, when this was prophesied to Zechariah and Elizabeth, they were like, I don't think that's possible. That, that's not the implication of Mary's words here. Mary is truly just asking. Um, I haven't done what has to happen for that to happen. So how can that happen? She wasn't saying she didn't think it could happen. She was like, I don't understand what you're saying. It's more of a lack of understanding for Mary. I think I would have probably had that same question. Like, how, how, how is that going to happen? Um, and so that's, that's the implication there. She, it wasn't a lack of faith. It was truly, she was bewildered. Verse 35, the angel replied to her, this is how it's going to happen, Mary. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, 
and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. It's amazing. And consider your relative Elizabeth. He gives an example. How cool is that? He gives an example. Consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived a son in her old age. And, and this is the sixth month for her who was called childless. This is probably when Mary found out that this happened. She probably didn't know yet that Elizabeth was pregnant. For her that was called childless. For nothing will be impossible with God. Verse 38. One of the most obedient verses in all of Scripture. I am the Lord's slave, said Mary. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel left her. We hear that every year. And again, we just like forget sometimes to just step back and look and think about how miraculous what God did is. We hear it, we've heard that so often that it just, it's just normal. It's not normal. It's not normal that God came to the earth as a man to save you from your sins. That's not normal. And, and so the angel Gabriel shows up again, and he says, Hey, Mary, God's found favor in you. And that's what God does. He finds regular people and uses them to do extraordinary things. I cannot explain that to you, how he does it and why he, I don't know. But he knew she was the right one. She knew it was the right time and the right one. He says, God's found favor in you. And even though you haven't had sex, and therefore it's impossible for you to be pregnant, humanly speaking, the Holy Spirit is going to miraculously conceive in you the Son of God, Yeshua. He's the promised Messiah, the Son of David. He's the King. Mary, you are going to birth the King, Savior of Israel that our nation has been looking for for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And at this point in time, I would have been like, whoa, you sure you got the right one? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I would have been like Moses. I would have started making up excuses. Lord, I can't talk good. Lord, they won't believe me. Lord, I killed somebody. God, you got the wrong guy. No way. Right? And then Mary's like, okay, let it be done as you say, Lord. Like, that verse in and of itself is a miraculous verse. The angel Gabriel shows up and says, hey, this unbelievable, inconceivable, no way you saw this coming thing is going to happen. And she just says, okay, let's do it. Sounds good, Lord. We could take a lesson from that. That ain't got nothing to do with the message today, but we could take a lesson from that verse, that level of faith, that, that, that true faith, that just... You say it, I'll do it. You know best, here we go. Let's rock and roll. I mean, there's so many implications in her accepting this. And, and, and you know, most of you know this that have grown up in church. And if you haven't, that, that's okay. We'll, we'll explain most of this. But I mean, for, for a Hebrew woman to show up pregnant before her married, marriage date and the husband knowing he hadn't done the thing that has to happen for her to be pregnant, that's a scandal. Plain and simple. It was a, it'd be a scandal now. It was a scandal then. It was a big deal. It's a huge deal. But she just says, okay, I guess we'll just figure all that out. I guess I'll just convince Joseph that the Holy Spirit conceived in me the Son of God and everything will work out. You know, because that's how guys handle information like that. <laughs> it's just crazy. So her relative Elizabeth is six months pregnant with her son, John. And it's a miraculous pregnancy as well. Not quite the same as Mary's, but still a very miraculous, present, uh, very miraculous pregnancy. So Mary naturally, I think naturally says, okay, well, I think I'm going to go see Elizabeth. I'm going to go see Ocuz. See what Ocuz is up to because this is, surely she was overwhelmed just a little bit. So she's going to go see Elizabeth since the angel Gabriel has mentioned her by name. And so that's what she does. We pick it back up in verse 39. In those days, so not very long after this was told to her, Mary set out and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah, where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped inside her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she exclaimed with a loud cry, You are the most blessed of women, and your child will be blessed. How could this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me, Elizabeth is saying? For you see, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped for joy inside of me. 
because what was spoken to her by the Lord will be fulfilled. Verse 46, we finish here in this section. And Mary said, and so she goes into a long song. I'm just giving you the first two verses of it. Mary says, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, because he has looked with favor on the humble condition of his slave. Mary says, this is, this is nuts, okay? I show up to my cousin's house, and her six-month-old developing child recognizes that I'm pregnant, and that I'm carrying the Son of God. What is happening? How could God choose me for this? How is God actually doing this? What does all this mean for my life? It's an amazing thing that takes place. But did you catch all the joy there all through that section? A whole lot of joy taking place in what God's doing here in, 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 in this birth of his son. I mean, Jesus has been conceived, not born, conceived for a few days. And a six-month-old developing John recognizes Jesus and Mary's pre presence. Think about that. A six-month-old developing child inside of Elizabeth recognizes Mary, and not just Mary, but Jesus' presence. They recognize that she is carrying the Son of God. Jesus, ha Jesus hasn't even existed yet outside of the womb. He hasn't even existed yet outside of the womb, and his presence on this earth is already causing joy. There's already joy taking place, and this dude hasn't even taken his first breath yet. He's only been conceived for a few days. Now, we could spend a lot of time here on this truth. We could spend some time here, and I could harp on this. I, I'm usually not one <laughs> to harp on certain things. I don't know. We may disagree. But I'm not, because I, I don't like to take a subject like this and feel like someone, like I'm beating someone up, because that's, that's not the truth. That's not ever what I want to do. Truth and grace, hopefully, not just truth. But we'll leave it to this. Sounds to me like there's a lot more happening in the wombs of these women than just a clump of cells laying around. And we'll leave it at that. So, this is crazy, right? This, this, this thing of Jesus being born, that we, that we do all this, you know, this coming Sunday night, the, the youth will, will do a Christmas play. We have movies about it. We talk about it. It's many people's favorite time of year, the, the Christmas season, the, the, the joy of the Savior being born. This is an incredible thing that God has done. And, and I personally try every year to, to think about this as if it's the first time I've heard it. And I hope, I hope you do that a little bit too. Like, let's increase our wonder and our awe at what God has done through these, through, through these regular people, these regular Joes. He just did something crazy. He just said, yep, here's the one I've been waiting on. Mary, a nobody. And now, almost the whole known world, a good portion of the whole known world for 2,000 years now, knows her name because God said, yep, that one. That one's going to be the one that mothers my child. That one's going to be the one that's going to have to, that has the strength and the trust in me to do this. I mean, it would have been easy, er, for Mary to say, I don't want to do this. This is too much. I mean, they were practicing Jews. They didn't quite understand what all it meant to be the Messiah, but they were pretty sure. So some, some rabbis during that time thought that it was going to be two, a suffering Messiah and a conquering Messiah. I don't know where Mary fell in that camp. Some, some people thought it would be one that would do both. All at the same time. Nobody thought it would be one that came and did it, suffered, and then came back as the conqueror. That was missed by all of them. But they were all thinking like, so she had to have been thinking, I think she would have been thinking, 
Well, if he's the Messiah, that means he's got to suffer. I'm not sure I'm ready for that, God. How, how can I rejoice knowing what's coming down the road? How can I raise this child and know that you're going to take him away? See, we read this story and we just act like Mary's a machine. She's not. She's just like you and me. There's no telling how many nights she spent begging God to find a different way. (laughs) There's no telling how many nights she spent grieving the loss of her son's earthly human life. But it didn't take away her joy. It didn't take away her joy. And, and, And Peter, where we're about to go, does a great job in two verses explaining it. And we talk about it Every Sunday, because it matters that much. But Peter explains it in two verses in 1 Peter. So if you want to go ahead and flip there, we'll read through these two verses. Now, he talks about it a lot during this whole section. We talked about this section the first week of Advent when we talked about hope. Because it's where we get the verse, the living hope. Same, same section of Scripture. But 1 Peter, verses 8 and 9. You love him, Peter talking to the churches that were receiving his letter. You love him, though you have not seen him. And though not seeing him now, you believe in him and rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Beautiful verses, full of truth, full of so much. We could, we could probably do a month on those two verses, but instead we're going to do about four and a half minutes, maybe five He says, you love him, though you hadn't seen him. He's, Peter's talking to churches all around Asia Minor that were all a generation removed from actually seeing Jesus. Right? All the people in Scripture didn't see Jesus. People came to faith during the apostles' time that hadn't ever actually seen him before or after resurrection. And he says, hey, you hadn't seen him. But even though you hadn't seen him, you trust our personal testimony. You trust what we have told you to be the truth. You believe in him. That word belief is is to trust in someone. It's not to mentally assent to knowledge. Like the majority of the American church has done for a long, long, long time. Yeah, I know who Jesus is. Cool dude. Mm -mm. No. This belief, this trust is, I have nothing else that I can depend on fully, but the truth of the gospel. That's belief. And if you've never gone through anything in your life that has proven that to you, that you have nothing else to trust in fully, but the gospel of Jesus will bless your heart. I'm glad life has been so great, but you'll probably go through something at some point in time, and you'll come to that point where it's like, okay, either this is real, or it's not, and it's past like, I show up on Sundays and tip my hat to God. It's past that. Like my whole eternity rides on it. So he says, you hadn't seen him, but you believe in him. And rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy. Which is where Chris Tomlin gets those lyrics that we just sang at the beginning of today. Now here's the cool thing. This is, this is true. Okay? I wish, I, wish jo- I wish Josh and I were humanly this good. Okay? But we're not. Right? So, of course, I had an idea of where we were headed, and Josh had an idea of where we were headed, and we pray about it and all those types of things. But I hadn't really looked at the songs we were singing this week. Okay? And, I'm, and it's the middle of the week, and like, it's a, it's a navigation when you go through where God wants you to go for a message. And it was like, where are we going? Because joy could go so many different ways. And then finally, it was just like, boop, right there to this verse. And I was like, there's a song that sings about that. Because I love, I love that version of Joy to the World we just sang. And I was like, huh, I wonder if Josh 
picked that song. So I got on Planning Center, which is where we keep up with all that. And I was, I was like, cool, we're singing that song already. I didn't even have to ask. I was like, that, that's just cool how God does little things like that that goes, yeah, you listen for once. Good job, buddy. So <laughs> the, the, the Holman New Testament commentary says it like this when it talk, talking about this verse and, and the joy that comes from following Christ and knowing Christ is your Savior. The biblical joy does not depend on circumstances. Joy is inseparably connected to love and trust. Even during pain, the fullness of joy comes from a deep sense of the presence of God in our lives. We can experience joy in suffering when we believe our suffering has a redemptive or refining purpose. I'll put that on the screen because that's good. We can experience joy in suffering when we believe, when we trust, when we know without a shadow of a doubt that our suffering, in our suffering, that that suffering has a redemptive or refining purpose. Either God is redeeming you or someone through it, or he's refining you and stripping away parts of you that just don't need to be there anymore. And that's what suffering will do or break you. That's the other option. Suffering might break you. Suffering might, you might get a hardened heart and say, that's it. I'm done with this God thing. It's not real. Which means you never believed it in the first place. That's what that means. So we can experience joy in suffering when we believe our suffering has a redemptive or refining purpose. That's the whole context of what Peter's talking about in this section we're looking at. The churches that he was writing this letter to were, were in the midst of and were about to be even more than they realized in the midst of some incredible suffering and persecution. Not, not Facebook blanked out my post, so I'm being persecuted as a Christian. Not that. That's the kind of stuff we think is persecution nowadays, like real persecution, physically thrown in jail, beaten, killed, destroyed lives, like real persecution. I think they would laugh at us at how soft we are sometimes when it comes to what we consider persecution. That's not part of the message either. I'll move on. One last thing here. So this, right in the middle of this verse here, see, there, there's two words put together. Most of the time, these two words are used separately. Okay, so that, that there's, there's two words in Greek that, that, that's used in the New Testament most of the time to either say joy or the expression of joy. But here, Peter takes the two words and puts them together. He made sure that the people hearing this in Greek, and we do a good job of explaining it in the English, he made sure to, to make it clear that this kind of joy was different than anything else. Like you would not miss this. Excuse me. Uh, this, this first word is aglaaho in its root form. Agalaho, it's a verb. It's to be filled with delight, filled with great joy. The second word there is kara, which, which kind of loosely has filtered down into English at the same root word as charity, kind of a similar word, okay? Kara, which is the noun the, of joy, rejoicing, happiness, gladness, and they're right there together. Anytime you double state something like that in, in Greek, you are making a point, and Peter is making a point here that you are filled with delight and joy and rejoicing and happiness all together. And then those two words there at the end. So you got those two words together, and then the last two words, and a lot, and a lot. This one's hard. And ek la etos. I cannot say that word. I've tried so many times. And ek la etos, especially when I have taken decongestants and my tongue's like heavy. It's really hard to roll those words off. It's kind of stuffy today. I took some decongestants and it makes it hard to talk. Uh, so that word there is, is unspeakable or inexpressible. That is the only time this word in this form is used in all of the New Testament. One time right here, talking about the joy that it is to know salvation. And then, and then, and then chi is a conjective word, and it's building in power when that, that chi is there. And then that last word is doxadzo, which means to glorify, to give praise, to honor. So in the English we say, and rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy. But the rejoice and the joy are together in the, in the Greek, and then the same words follow it. And, and so it would have been, it's, it's a very, very strong statement about the power and importance of this joy. And then in verse 9, reminds us of why. Why do we have this inexpressible joy? Because you are receiving the goal of your faith. You don't come to faith in Christ just because. There's a reason to believe in Jesus. 
There's a reason to trust God. And there's no better reason or thing or purpose or meaning to live your life for. Anything else you build for in this life is just temporary. And any of you that have lived for five seconds know that this life goes by really, really, really fast. Really fast. And so if all you're building your life for is the stuff in this life, what a waste of time. What a waste of time. Solomon told us that. I build all this stuff up and then somebody else comes along and gets it after me. Because I die. How stupid. My translation. That's close to the way he said it. So what are we saying? And we'll finish up and go eat a wonderful meal. And those of you that are here visiting, please feel free to stay and join us for this meal. It'll be great. What we're saying is circumstances change, but our joy, our joy in Christ is constant regardless of circumstance. It is unaffected by circumstance. We are not unaffected by circumstance. Our joy is unaffected by circumstance. It will always come back to that. If you have faith in Jesus in the darkest depths of life, whatever life throws on you, somehow, some way, when you have true believing, redemptive, saving faith, the Holy Spirit will go, yeah, but salvation's coming. You're saved. You're being saved. And you will be saved forever. And something goes, all right. I'll make it through one more day. Sometimes I'll make it through five more minutes. Sometimes I'll make it through one more hour. But it's always there. It always shows up. This inexpressible joy. It means, it means we literally can't express it with words. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. We ought to try. We ought to try as hard as we can to actually express the true joy it is to know Jesus Christ as your Savior and your King. But we can't. We cannot express it clearly enough. Last statement, we're, we'll finish up in prayer and in song. The king of joy, he is the king of joy because we have living hope, because we are at peace with God, because Jesus saved us from our sins. That, that one sentence encapsulates the last three weeks. He's the king of joy because we have living hope, because we are at peace with God, because Jesus saved us from our sins, circumstances, regardless. I'm going to pray for us, and if you would like to come express that today is the day that you finally clicked. The Holy Spirit did something, even though I stumbled through all this, and the Holy Spirit said, you need to know Jesus today. Then come down here during this song, and we'll express that to the church, and we will celebrate with you over that truth. Or if you just need to pray during this song, that'd be great. Whatever. If you want to express your joy through song, that's fine too. It's all, it's all good during this time. I'll pray for us, and we'll, and we'll move into that. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the joy that comes from knowing you as king and as savior. Thank you that the joy you give us, God, is irrespective of earthly circumstance, God. We can take those circumstances and know that you're redeeming or refining, but you're doing something that brings things to the good. Your glory, our ultimate good, eternal good. Thank you for heaven. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you have given us this wonderful gift. May we reflect on that this time of year and be filled up with what it is to know Christ as Savior with that, that joy that is just eternally abiding deep within us, God. Thank you for that truth today, God. I also ask that you would take the food that we have today, God. We want to give you thanks for that, that you'd bless it and, and, and bless it to our bodies, that we would take the blessings that you give us and use it for others, God, and that you would, uh, Lord, bless those who have helped prepare this food and all the things that we get to enjoy today. Thank you for them, and thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen.